Okay, so I'm juggling two talks today. The first one is on concept calculus, and the second one is on incompleteness. And um, both of these topics are in a very serious state of flux. Um, that's a code word for the results are changing daily. <laughs> And therefore, the reliability is not quite as high as it should be, and, and, and there's very little written down. But I have a habit of eventually uh, uh, something happening, for real, you know, that, that's written down um, within, say, 40 or 50 years, certainly, but, but hopefully this year. <laughs> so so um, the one I've been sort of preoccupied the most with is the second talk the incompleteness, and it's sort of taken my mind a little bit away from, the, uh, from this one. Um, and um, uh, I have some surprises for you uh, on that front. This one, not as many surprises. Um, so I'm gonna do an, a little introduction. Uh, and to make this even remotely intelligible, I didn't say intelligible, I said remote, even remotely intelligible, which is weaker. Uh, uh, I have to, I give you some, some sort of core system that all of the axiom systems have this in common, so I don't have to keep repeating this. And it's a very friendly core system, it's something pretty interesting. Unfortunately, I couldn't put more into it because I bifurcate here. Uh, some of these systems use an, a, a choice principle and some don't. If they all use the choice principle, believe me, I would have thought of putting the choice principle in the core, <laughs> but, but I can't. So this is, a, you know, it's a little bit uh, tricky uh, to make this intelligible. Uh, there are two basic, uh, no, the, the, I think there are, but, I don't know, three or four basic ideas in these systems that I'm going to describe. Um, and uh, one of them says that the real world, oh, all of the systems except for the divine system, except for the divine system, all of the systems involve two worlds, and only two worlds, the real world and the supernatural world. By default, because I, I like to uh, keep, I don't like to make a two-sorted theory flat out like that. By default, the world is the supernatural world. And the real world is a sub-world, sub okay? But that, that's how it's set up. That may not be the best way you would want to set this up uh, all the time. You know, it may not be the best way. But, so, but in other words, the quantifiers range over, over the supernatural objects, which include the natural objects, of course, okay? So th that's the general framework. Exactly one of these systems, the divine system, um, which is the one with the theological, which is theologic, which is explicitly theologically motivated, uh, uh, based on um, a small fragment of what Gödel was using in his proof of the existence of God. Um, that one is involves is it, it, there's only one world, the real world. There's no supernatural. I kick out all the all the supernatural objects are gone from that system. There's only one world in the divine system. Now, there's also something else about this. It is completely clear that a casual person looking at, this, at these systems, just casually, without uh, really, uh, really uh, being awake, if you were, uh, say, half awake, you would think that I was doing non-standard analysis. It's completely clear that this is exactly like non-standard analysis in some sense, and exactly not like non-standard analysis in other senses. And it would be nice if uh, uh, somebody looked into this, you know, with the right kind of lens. Um, uh, in some sense, I think what I'm doing is I'm taking very strong systems, not like um, um, ACA not not like RCA not or ACA not, but higher impregnative systems. In some sense, I'm taking systems and I'm doing something to them, giving non-standard forms. That's sort of like taking the weak things and doing the non-standard stuff, which 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 has now been done a lot. It's somewhat like this, 
Okay, and, and that's not the way I thought of it originally. But formally, it's just very much like that. So now you can ask the following. You can say, all right, take any idea. What's the non-standard form of it? So the idea here is, with these impredictive comprehension axioms is an idea. What's the, what's the non-standard form of it? Well, that's this supernatural stuff I'm talking about. And then if you take the, the regular uh, combinatorial stuff and you do this, you get the usual systems of non-standard arithmetic and non-standard analysis, which are logically far, far weaker. Because you're starting with something predicative, it stays predicative. But if you start with something, now this, le the lesson from this talk is you start with something moderately strong, but, uh, but highly impredicative. You start with something impredicative, you start with something at the level of Z2, actually. You start with something at the level of Z2, and you, and you work this non-standard stuff, what do you get? You get, the, some of it is as strong as the entire large cardinal hierarchy. <laughs> so it completely explodes. And now, uh, there's a lot of stuff, including stuff that I did when I was a student, on the non-standard arithmetic analysis side, where you want to show conservative extension. You don't get anything more in some sense. Um, I can tell you a little story about that. When that was open for arithmetic in the very early days, we're talking about the bad old days of 1966 or something like that. Yes, I am that old. Okay, this, um, uh, 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 I remember that um, Abraham Robinson was in, got interested in this. So I think maybe even Abraham Robinson raised this question. You know, is not standard arithmetic conservative over standard arithmetic? in appropriate formalizations. And I proved that it was conservative by formalized, non formalized completeness theorems and formalized non-standard models, you know, stuff like that. Now probably used by everybody who does this kind of thing, of course. Um, and I had heard from my thesis advisor, Gerald Sachs, I had heard, and from others, that Abraham Robinson was very annoyed that this was the key. <laughs> he was very annoyed with this, and maybe even by, annoyed by me doing this, you know, because he wanted, his idea was that it shouldn't be conservative. It gives you new, but in the context I'm talking about now, it's explosively powerful, fantastically powerful. So that might even be behind the anticipation of this happening, might have be behind some of Gödel's remarks about an enthusiasm about non-standard analysis. You know, I'll, I'll bring you to those quotes, which I haven't looked at in detail for a while, but he may have had this idea that, that it was highly non-conservative, even, even though that's not true in the very usual stuff that happened. It is true in this stuff. So I don't know that he had, you know, maybe he had a glimpse of this, you see. That large cardinals is non-standard set theory. Is what I know. It's basically. I'm now ad libbing, by the way. I just, you know, I haven't started the talk. I basically gave, gave it, right? But uh, I have ad libbing here. But what I'm saying is that non standard set theory is large cardinals. That's an interesting formulation. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about something. What I, what, well, let's, now let's try to get into some details. So concept calculus generally seeks to isolate fundamental principles about informal concepts that are used in everyday reasoning outside mathematics, science, and engineering. This process creates formal systems associated with various groups of informal concepts. So the, um, the, the uh, how should I put it, the um, bold idea here is this, that you don't try to just take everything there is in this world and fit it into um, into calculus and a little bit of physics. And, you know, in other words, you don't try to do, you don't try to push everything into existing frameworks that we know are extremely good. You don't try to push everything else in this world. It's very hard to, put a, to push emotions and, and, and love into, um, into physics and chemistry. We know this is difficult, right? And they don't even try to do that. So instead of trying to put emotions, you know, love and, uh, and uh, music into, um, into uh, mathematics, into physics and chemistry and mathematics, we, we let them thrive in their own setting. And then we pull out principles about them where we don't mess with the language. We keep the language, the language of love and, uh, and um, 
uh, uh, motions or whatever you want, want to do. Or, you know, or notions like big and small and um, this is more important than that and this is more beautiful than that and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And this, this, this is a bigger jump from that. This is much larger. A is larger than B. A is so large compared to B that it's larger than the comparison between D and C, right? In a context where there's no numbers at all. We don't try to force this into numbers as a scientist would. How do we quantify this? We let it stew in its own juice. And then we try to extract logical statements where the language is kept primitive. So, so this is a very, uh, how should I put it? This is a very um, uh, very much the opposite of, of the standard scientific tradition, which is to be specific, quantify stuff, and make experiments. We let the stuff sit in its own juice. I mean, perhaps, you know, in the theory of, of cuisine and cooking, there are some similar ideas, I, you know, and so forth. Okay, so um, now we discovered that many of the formal systems that naturally arise have surprisingly great interpretation power. So the, the insight here is that in many contexts when you do this, you can pick out logical principles that make some reasonable sense so that you get a formal system in these primitives that are, that are very familiar but unfamiliar to the scientist, engineer, mathematician, very familiar to, to informal thinkers. You can pull out formal systems which have the property that they're mutually interpretable with the standard systems of set theory and mathematics. So you get an equivalence between the informal, non-scientific world and the scientific world. Mathematical world, say. That's what one discovers. And I think of this as a very broad subject. Um, in fact, I made a little Gedanken a calculation. I determined that this was approximately one million times the size of the current body of science, engineering, and mathematics we have. You know, it's, it's incomparably bigger subject. Uh, because the amount of informal reasoning that's going on is gigantic, and it's varied, and it's technical. In, in, in many ways, technical, because we are born with a lot of language abilities automatically. We can do things like, uh, I mean, if you just took the logical structure of this pseudo talk I've been giving here, you would find that it was incomparably more complicated than anything in mathematics you know, the intricate logical relations. You know, I mean, it's very difficult, you know, to make a semantics for English that really does anything much for you, you know. So you get, get an idea. It's a much more involved subject, much deeper, millions of times more, uh, 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 much broader than um, the whole of science, mathematics, and engineering, you know. Okay, all right, so, but only a little bit has been developed, of course, and you know, and I met him on, uh, when I said that startling remark, I'm talking about the potential of the subject. You know. um, all right, so if a system interprets the usual ZFC axioms for math, we say that the system provides a consistency proof for math. Because this is, any, this is because any purported inconsistency in math is convertible to an inconsistency in the system via the interpretation. And when, you, and when you are tr uh, presenting a formal system, the implicit idea is, if you're, is, is that you're a believer, at least in the internal consistency of that system. So that's the kind of uh, way I'm looking at this. So when I wrote a paper called The Divine Consistency Proof for Math, I was talking about you know, the, interpret the, interpret the interpretation of ZFC in a formal system motivated by theological considerations. All right, now I'm just going to talk about the, a corner that's presented in this abstract eight supernatural consistency proofs for mathematics. But um, let me just brief preview uh, the, the bulk of writings that I've, that I've made on concept calculus. And all of these can be downloaded from this web, my, my website, which has a manuscript section. So there's one published paper 
which is, um, and there's one submitted paper, and there are several abstracts in, uh, uh, in, in addition to the above from FOM. Uh, we made earlier versions of 515. Um, I can't remember what five. Uh, 515 is the one about eight, eight supernatural consistency proofs. So this is this is this has appeared. This you can get. It's in a volume called New Frontiers in Research on Infinity, but you can get it from my website. And that's appeared in that volume. A divine consistency proof is to appear. I have to send back some editorially generated corrections. Um, uh, so that's basically on the website also. Then there's a thing called Concept Calculus Universes, which is submitted uh, uh, paper, haven't heard back. Um, and that one's uh, the idea of universes, which is a little bit like physical universes, except all the physics and math is gone because nobody knows any physics and math except a tiny number of people on the planet, right? So you just talk about universes. They go out a long way and you, know, you, you can see what, 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 I don't want to talk about that. that, that's, a, that that's certainly a perfectly reasonable talk, maybe more reasonable than this talk. But <laughs> I don't want to get into that. Um, and then, um, and, and by the way, that goes through uh, uh, second order arithmetic to Zamello to Zamello Frankel to um, uh, measurable cardinals to, to uh, elementary embedding axioms of limited kinds. I mean, so it's a pretty big range. The, um, the the universe's paper. The universe's paper. Okay, so uh, then there's these abstract these talks and abstracts in various places, um, and uh, MIT and uh, Canada and Banff Canada and Baltimore, Maryland, and Carnegie Mellon. Okay, so now these these consistency these these uh, systems I'm talking about today, if I ever start to talk, is um, are, are essentially flat. I mean, not completely flat, but essentially flat. They only have the first two levels of Russell's type theory. They they all are based on two types, objects and classes of objects, nothing else. Now, now they're adorned with maybe some function symbols and relation symbols, but, th but there's only two sorts of objects, objects and classes of objects, okay? Now, it turns out that it's well, well, widely known that the first two levels of Russell's type theory, if you don't have anything else, is impoverished, very seriously impoverished, and it's tame and all that kind of stuff. It's like, uh, you know, uh, monadic stuff on, um, without any, any other stuff, you know, you, decision procedures and all that kind of stuff. But one novelty, and even if you have the full comprehension axioms, you're gonna have the full comprehension axioms, you still don't get anything, really. But what I like to do is I put a pairing function on the objects. And the justification for a pairing function on the objects, where objects is objects in this world, which is far more than the mathematical objects or the physical objects, it's just objects. How, here's the proof that there's a pairing function that's one, one. Take any two objects, A and B, take the idea of A followed by B. The idea of A followed by B. Well, it's clear that if the idea of, of A followed by B and the idea of B fo C followed by D are equal, then A equals C and B is D, right? Okay, you know, this kind of talk. I mean, maybe you can criticize it, and maybe I'll, I should use something else other than idea. But the idea is, that was a pun, the idea is that pairing is, is a very primitive idea, ordered pairing. Okay, so now if you have ordered pairing and objects and classes of objects, not binary relations, that's taken care of, you see. That's a smooth system of two levels of, of Russell type theory, okay? So that's a, that's a very good system. Now it has a trivial model of a single point. You have, a sing, you have only one object and you have two uh, uh, classes and the pairing function is stuck being the identity map because there's only one pair. <laughs> It's because there's only one object, right? But if you add the axiom that there exists at least two things, then you do get a very, then you get a system that's, that's mutually interpretable with Z2. 
So, it, you know, it becomes substantial. So it's a very, very good base theory for this kind of thing. This, the, the, what, what I just described is, is the core. Uh, I, I throw in extensionality. Um, that seems to be a, a, the best option. Um, you know, if I, had, if I wanted to say something about intentional concepts, I wouldn't do that, but I don't, I'm not trying to say anything about that. So, so you also have the extensionality. All right, now, um, there are two general principles overriding this, these things. The super, uh, this is the, uh, uh, except, for, except, for, except for the divine consistency proof, which doesn't have two worlds. All the other ones have two worlds. There's the supernatural world, which is called the world, as I said. And then there's this smaller world called the real world. Now, the supernatural world is more extensive than the real world. The real world and the supernatural world are similar in various respects. There's an interaction between the real world and the, su and the supernatural world. Okay, and I play on the various interactions. Okay, you want to call that the non-standard you know, universe and the, and the standard universe? You see, you see how similar this is. Right. So you will find elaborate transfer principles of various ilks here that create tremendous power by the standards of ordinary, by, the, by, by, by a comparison to the standard, non-standard mathematics, non-standard arithmetic and analysis. Don't get on the, don't get anywhere, don't get on the chart of the chart of the chart of the charts of this kind of strength, okay? Just very minimal, okay. All right, so... Yeah, that's the remark. Now, Gödel wrote a couple of paragraphs about non-standard analysis. See, remark on non-standard analysis, 1974, in his Collected Works, Volume 2, and also page 311, 37, 310, and 311. I can't remember exactly what those were, but I, I looked them up before I came here. Okay, uh, left the States. So, um, you know, again, I think it's intriguing to even speculate whether some what, what is the origin of Gödel's enthusiasm? He said this could be the mathematics of the future, logic or mathematics of the future. I can't remember the language. Uh, you know where you could more easily get get a lot of information you couldn't get otherwise. I'm not sure he quite said that. But anyways, you know it'd be it'd be interesting to know uh, uh, if he had something in mind or had a general feeling because I, I don't think you'll find in Gödel. I don't think you'll find in Gödel that large cardinals are non is non-standard set theory. In fact, he probably thought it was standard set theory in some sense. But uh, you know, but you know, I mean, it's not clear. You know, whether he made a connection between large cardinals, even imagine it, imagine a connection between large cardinals and non-standard transfer ideas. I don't know that he he actually that actually came to him. Okay, all right, so. So this core is, as I said, variables over objects, variables over classes of objects. Oh, we do have equality between both sorts. And then we have this pairing function, P. And then we have, of course, epsilon between objects and classes. And um, uh, and then the axioms of the core are the usual logic axioms of classical logic and pairing axiom, extensionality, as I said, in comprehension, full comprehension. Now, I've never, you know, even considered what happens in this treatment if I start getting, if I start restricting the comprehension axiom. As you know, I, 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 I've had experience with restricting comprehension axioms in, in, in second order arithmetic, as you know, but I never even considered uh, this here. Okay. Um, now, if you add, so repeating myself, if you add the axiom that there's at least two things, which some people do believe in, right? I mean, you know, that there exists at least two things, um, two objects, objects, uh, you get a system that's mutually interpretable with, with Z2. And this is, um, you know, not completely trivial by any means. You know, it's a basic fundamental thing that, that, that should be maybe even taught, you know, so we should have this. All right, now, the first system is the most basic transfer system you can imagine. Uh, we, uh, we have, um, first of all, we have to have one and three. 
to even talk about transfer. So there's no real world yet. We're going to, in core, there's no real world. There's, there's just one world. So we add a class constant symbol, RO, for real objects. RO for real objects. So there's this class. I, 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 like, the, I like it that it's a constant symbol. I prefer it to other, other ways of doing this. You know, you could do other things. You could add a predicate symbol. But it seems more innocent and, and uh, less jarring to just add a constant symbol, <laughs> so, which, which will be sufficient. Okay, so we add a constant symbol, RO, for the class of all real objects. And now we can talk about transfer. For any formula phi, phi slash RO is the result of relativizing down to the real, to the real world. So all the quantifiers, um, all the quantifiers um, that range over all objects become, range instead now over RO. And all the quantifiers that range over classes of objects range over subclasses of RO. Now, you, you, you have to worry extremely. You have to actually be, get sleep deprived over worrying about parameters and everything else. And you can be very happy about how few parameters I'm allowing when I do this, right? But the basic idea is that this transfers, you should get the same things, okay? And we, we just have to say what. Now, this turns out to be essentially a worthless system unless we have two choice, the choice operator. Now, this is a very, very important system also. The core, core with, uh, core with, um, with choice. Um, oops. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, this is just the language of EQ, not the actual system. Yeah, right. I was worried that transfer isn't here. But transfer is a principle, not a language. <laughs> like which I don't, okay, so, all right, so, um, so, th but th there is a basic system here, namely, forget about number four, just one through three, so this is very important, a uh, core is important for obvious reasons we talk about, you know, but, but, uh, if you have, um, choice, this is a, an important system to do lemmas about, Core plus choice. And choice now, this is, isn't that prettier than the actual choice in set theory? You see, we're gaining something by having flatness. Look at that, it's beautiful. CH is now a function symbol that's thrown in. And we write CH of A epsilon A, if A is not empty. I mean, I, I just changed the notation. This is basically says if A is not empty, then CH of A is a member of A. In other words, you get to pick an element from every set uniformly, and you just add a function symbol. Now, you use that function symbol in core. See, core, the comprehension axiom is for all formulas in the language. Every time I do this, the core is always sensitive to the entire language. The comprehension axiom is, involves always the full language. Some other things you have to be more careful about. Like transfer principles, you can't put any old thing in there. You've got to be careful. But, but the core always, you know, you put the, uh, is always for the full language. Now, this transfer principle says that if I have exactly one parameter for a real object, then I have equivalence. Now, you can do finally many parameters using pairing. I mean, you know, there's no, but, but say one, one, convenient to stay with just one. Every free variable is V1. Okay, now this is a very natural system. This is a, this is a very natural system viewed as a non-standard extension of, um, of, a, of a core system. Because I, you know, I'm, I'm throwing a choice also. And this gives you a tremendous strength. I mean, you know, really tremendous strength. The strength of this system is um, second order indescribable cardinals which are far, far beyond Malo cardinals, but they're lower than um, things like the subtle cardinal hierarchy. But they're far bigger than weakly compact, things like that. Okay, far bigger. Um, and in fact, uh, I give some equivalences. To, uh, the, the T1 is just uh, a second order indescribability. 
as a scheme indexed by the number of quantifier alterations. And the second one is uh, a little different, is uh, there's a well ordering of some V lambda, where V kappa is an initial segment of V lambda, and where V kappa epsilon is a pi one n elementary substructure of V lambda. So it's second order elementary extension of ranks with respect to a well order is the, um, turns out to be a system, uh, a technical system in set theory, which is, equicons which is mutually interpretable with second order indescribables as a scheme. And these, both these systems are, um, are mutually interpretable with this transfer principle. Okay, so that's the simplest thing I have here. Also the weakest. <laughs> All right. And then I, I, do, I go through, uh, I, you know, I, clearly I, I, I'm giving a different kind of talk than I might have thought when I was writing this, that you, you wanted some real meat proofs. But we can't have both. We can't have real intellectual meat and technical proofs at the same time, you know, take up too much time. All right. So we have the sort of the argument for this. All right, now, the second idea is extensions. And this drives all the rest of the systems except the divine system. Um, but I could also go back to the transfer system we just described and also beef it up in certain ways that I didn't put in this talk. So you see, everything is a state of flux. All right, so... The extension principle says this, if I have a structure in the real world, then I can extend it to a similar structure in the world, in the supernatural world. And this is very familiar to non-standard people because it's just written star. You have, you have a, a, a is something standard and then A star is the non-standard form. So I'm just doing this, you see. This is the second idea. The first idea was, a, was, was just a transfer of statements. The second idea is, is I'm actually lifting objects. This should be more powerful, and it is. Okay. Actually, I'm, there's some questions about how powerful it is that I don't understand. You know, that I was going to work out before this talk, but I got off into some stuff with the second talk. So I'm kind of in a state of flux here. Did you have a question? No? You weren't raising your hand, okay. I know you were literally were raising your hand, but you weren't raising your hand in the sense of, okay, got it. All right, so the, um, the first extension system is called EX1, because that means there's gonna be a couple more. And you have the language of the core, you have the, the core, the language is the core R0 as before, but now we have a unary function symbol F from objects to classes and we don't have a choice operator. I'm getting away in this one with no choice operator, and then, the, and then L of X2 will have choice operator. Somebody might say, well, Friedman, you know, your transfer principle is extremely compelling for informal thinking. The real world, the natural world, you can't tell whether you're in the supernatural or in the real world, you know, blah, blah, blah. I love this, but I don't like choice because I don't know how to make choices. You know, you can complain. So it would be nice to have something in this vein that doesn't rely on choice. Okay, so that's what I do. But I do need a, a, a some, I do need some juice, uh, some power pack juice, if I'm not going to have choice. So that's what this unary function is from objects to classes. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's actually a surjection from the, from the, world, the supernatural world of objects onto the subclass, subclasses of RO, onto the real classes. In other, words, in other words, there are so many objects in this world that the objects have names for, it, for all the real classes. See, that's what this is going to be about. All right. Um, so the axioms are 
all formulas, the core, extended by the, the new language, supernatural plenitude, which is the uh, thing I was just mentioning, Supernatural plenitude. See how pretty this stuff is when you write, write it in this form. Uh, that every uh, real class is the image of, of um, is in the range of, of the function. So it's, it's subjective, onto, as I said, subjective onto the power set of the real objects. Um, and, and I call that supernatural plenitude. It means that, you know, that if you're living in the outer world, you can sort of eat alive the uh, real world. The real world is all in your hands, you see. Can't do that without that restriction because you'd run up against Cantor's, Cantor's theorem. The power set is always bigger, but the, but the real power set, the power set of real things is smaller than the, is, was no more than the entire objects in the world. That's called supernatural plenitude. So it has some motivation. And we have supernatural extension. Supernatural extension, which by the way is, was written wrong here. Uh, this is my typo. Uh, this is a Weyermann-like typo. Except that I, my cut and paste didn't work as well. So the only place that this is, occurs in this talk is right here. That should be the the, the proper inclusion should be an ordinary inclusion. Because, you know, um, A1 could be the empty set, for example. If you have a non-standard extension of something really small, like finite, it's going to be itself. But if it's sort of bigger, then it's going to blow up. Similarly here. Except that finite that doesn't mean finite. It means something much more sof sophisticated. Okay. All right. So... Uh, so that's what this principle says. You have to be careful about free and bound occurrences and all this junk, as you might imagine. So this system has the core, no choice. It says that the world of objects is extremely large. I mean, is, it covers all the real classes. And we have the, uh, the idea that any real thing can be blown up, has a, can be blown up into the uh, supernatural world, uh, and, and still have the same properties. Now, it's usually stated, you know, piecewise for each fee, but you can, you, can, you can actually make it uniform by adding more notation. You know, people know how to play that game, okay? Why is this so strong? The basic idea is that all of this extra baggage is, is fed back into the core. Because it's fed back into the core, and the core already starts with a, a strong idea, namely full comprehension, you know, full, uh, Russell comprehension. But we're feeding everything back into the core. That's why you get this po intoxicatingly powerful con uh, outcome. Okay. Any true statement in the real world about a real class lifts to a true statement in the supernatural world about some extension of, this, of the real class. I claim that in the FOM abstract that this system and the previous transfer system are mutually interpretable, but now I doubt this. And in any case, I do see that this system I just described can be proved consistent at least with kappa arrows omega, the partition property that's stronger than subtle cardinals, but, but way lower, stays within the excellent constructability compatible stuff. And I am sticking by the fact that, that this system EX1 is at least as strong as um, EQ1. Okay, that, that, I, that I don't have any problem with. But I think it's, it's strictly stronger and I, and I was trying to put it together and I didn't, I had to get off onto my um, even more in a state of flux second talk. I, I was under time pressure. Also I had to play the piano, you know, it's another, another pro problem that I have here. Okay, so the issue is instead of using choice to create a well ordering of the objects, we use supernatural plenitude. Okay, now, and then we can, we can build L. So in order to do this, you have to go, you have to use, you have to be fairly facile with another, uh, uh, we have to be fairly facile with the great invention of the great Kurt Gödel, which is the constructible universe and the technology involved in that. You have to, you have to use that in order to do, do this, this, this stuff.
In fact, I think even the, even the first thing needs Gödel's technology of L to do. Okay. All right. Um, now, what's wrong with choice? Let's wear our other hat. I don't mind choice. In fact, I, li I, I prefer it to plenitude. You know, there's the other guy who says, I don't mind plenitude, I prefer it to choice, right? <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so if you put choice in there, you get the same kind of thing. You know, I, the results are the same. I, I don't know that the system is exactly the same. You know, I don't have any exact calculations here until I get back, uh, back to a relatively boring place called Columbus, Ohio. I will uh, not be able to tell you. Um, so we, we can put choice in there. And then we, why don't we have a, our cake and eat it? Why don't we put all of it in here? Why don't we, why don't we simply combine these two things? And then, of course, I get the, the same results as far as I can tell. Kappa arrows omega will kill everything you know, from the top. And, you know, the bottom is there. The bottom should be raised. I, you know, I have, to, I have to examine that. All right. So that's fine. Now, we have a strong equivalent system called STEQ, strong equivalent system. And this time, we have choice, real objects. This time, we have a unary function symbol from objects to objects. This is a very radical thing. And, I, you know, very radical idea. And what it would mean in non-standard thinking generally is interesting. What does this function do for us? Well, this is going to be a bijection between the real objects and the supernatural objects. A bijection between the two. Wow. <laughs> a bijection between the two. Well, that sounds like that should, might be inconsistent or something, right? Well, it's not inconsistent. That I know. No, I don't know that, but I know it's, it's, I know it's interpretable in large cardinal theory. Heavy, much heavier duty large cardinal theory. So we have the core, we have choice, we have supernatural existence. Supernatural existence is just, there is a supernatural object. That's all I meant by that. That's, that's all. Real supernatural equivalence you can't allow C, though, in that, this, this, this correspondence function. You can't allow C in there um, for that. And that's the one, the real supernatural equivalence. I'm sorry, we're going back to the equivalence axioms. Uh, no, no, no. This is, this, no, no, sorry. This, isn't this the one, uh, this is the one that, um, I'm sorry, I got my notation right. Supernatural extent. Okay, I'm a little bit confused now. It looks like I'm using only the equivalence thing and not the extension for this one. So uh, there's a missing system in here. Okay, so a, a missing system in here. I, 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 I don't know what's an error and what isn't here. See, I told you the state of flux. But at least there's some, there's some bytes on the screen. Okay, we have this. All right, so, um, so now what happens is we certainly get past uh, sharps. You know the, the the in set theory the sharps, and it may be far stronger. And I, 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 I do I talk about my upper bound here? I know I do in the original paper. I guess I forgot to put it in here. I think I have an upper bound of something like um, uh, what's called um, uh, v kappa plus one into la v lambda plus one. Um, what is that called again? Uh, it's due to Reinhardt. It's the good one, the weaker one of Reinhardt. No, no, no. That, my zero is much bigger. Okay, I zero is easily enough to do this, because when I said, let's look at I zero. Let's look at uh, uh, an elementary embedding from V kappa into V kappa. Well, the domain and the target are the same cardinality. In fact, they're identical, right? You see, and the real objects are sort of like the image of the elementary embedding. That's how you get models of this. The image of the elementary embedding is RO, and the target space is um, the objects. And so you have an elementary substructure, you see. 
So you can play games with that. You can even do extensions, extend things by the elementary embedding. And so you build models of this kind of stuff. But in that case, what I just described, the image of the elementary embedding from V kappa to V kappa has cardinality kappa. Kappa is strongly inaccessible. As it has cardinality kappa. The image has cardinality kappa, obviously. And then the ambient space is also V kappa with cardinality kappa. So that's what this correspondence is all about. It's attempts to get to jumpstart us all the way up to J from V kappa to V kappa. Really leaving non-standard analysis in the usual sense, biting in the, you know, in the dust, right? <laughs> That's the idea behind the correspondence. Okay. But I don't know that I get this far. There's problems, technical problems involved. Okay, that's a strong one. And then I talk about the divine system, and then finally, the killer system. The non-standard gone wild system which is even much stronger than anything I'm talking about now. And by the way, it looks exactly like regular non-standard analysis. You'll see how, 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 how it looks exactly the same. All right, now the divine system, in the divine consistency proof, um, has the core, it has choice operator, it has this new concept called positive. So this a positive is a, un, is a unary predicate on classes. Some classes are positive, some classes are negative. Some classes are positive, some classes are not positive. Okay? And it has also a unary predicate for being definable, a class being definable. But this is innocent definability, not any crazy definability that has definability allowed in it or some crazy thing like that, like Gödel's ordinal definability of philosophical talk and technical talk. Not that. We're talking about definable means straight first order definable in the sense of Tarski with no issues. Okay? This is an innocent definability. Okay, and the divine system, you see, I, I keep pressing the delete button, which doesn't do anything, thankfully. Shows you what I think of all this. No, 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 I, I, I like this talk. I, like, I, don't, I don't want it to disappear. Okay, so here we have uh, div is <laughs> the divine system. And it doesn't mean division. Uh, it's, it's a little more exotic than ordinary division. Um, so we have the core in the language of the divine, and then we have um, choice, as before. We have positive classes. The axioms of positive classes really just say nicely that the positive classes form a non-principal ultrafilter. Non-principal ultrafilter, that's all. Just a non-principal ultrafilter. See, the only thing, there is something, by the way, by the, way the positive properties... Uh, uh, with Gödel, form a principal ultrafilter where the principal in the ultrafilter is God. But we're looking at the projection onto the real world. So in the real world, you don't have a perfect being, and so therefore the ultrafilter is non-principal. This is the key idea. So Gödel did not, as far as I could tell, think of or suggest that we project the positive properties, going back to Leibniz, the positive properties onto the real world. I don't think that, that, that he, he thought of doing that. I think he wanted to get his, um, his um, theology career uh, finished premature, you know, early. <laughs> I don't think this was something that he really uh, pushed. But, but, but basically, uh, uh, so we project the positive classes onto the real world, and we get a non-principal ultrafilter. That's why this is non-trivial. And now we have zero definable classes. That's just Tarski's uh, truth definition. That's all. I mean, formalized setup for that. In other words, anything definable from definable things is definable, and you know, so forth. Okay. Um, and then we have the axiom of divine object, which says, uh, I'd like to say, there's an angel. Namely, there is an object that has all the, po all the definable positive properties. Can't have all the positive properties because it's non principal ultra filter, but has all the definable properties, light faced. Now, there's a, mo a clear model for this, if, you know, briefly, 
you, you, you take uh, the non-principal ultra filter, you take the, a measurable cardinal and take the measure one ultra filter, which is conically additive, and you know there must be, whatever positive means, there are only can be many definable properties, there are only can be many definable positive properties, uh, and then you can take the intersection, because positive just means measure one, that's the interpretation. And so you, it's just the fact that this is a conically additive ultra filter that tells you there's an angel. <laughs> right, you know, just the crudest way. In fact, it tells you that there are a lot of angels and so forth and so on. So I, one of the things I never got into, you know, there was, I, I, I was worried about whether I could actually get this published at all, but, but, I, but you know, but it, you know, this question of, of going further and talking about how many angels there are and do the angels, how the angels relate to each other and so forth is for the future. Okay. <laughs> but, um, in other words, one of the things I was just briefly trying to do is, if you, if you know there's one angel, can you actually prove there are two? And this was not so clear. So there's a whole bunch of independence results coming, you know, using um, a little bit of, you know, using some, some uh, set theory of measurable cardinals and, and some fine structure stuff too, probably, I think you have to use. In order. So the application of, of fine structure and set theory to angels, you see, we have coming soon. All right, so now for the killer system. The killer system is a very basic idea. I just want to put everything on steroids. So what I do is, instead of saying that, that I can extend any real class into the supernatural, like I said before, so it has the same properties, instead of saying I can do that, I put a... I, put, I, I introduce a function symbol, star, that tells me how to extend, that gives me the extension, just like a non-standard analysis person would do, like A, A star, right? I put the star down, but then, now that I've got this new thing, first of all, I'm going to feed it back into the core. Because I told you everything gets fed back into the core. You know, the comprehension axiom is for all formulas. And the form is always in the extended language. So that's one thing I'm going to do. But I'm going to do more. Uh, the transfer principle is stated with the core. I, I can't remember exactly what I do, uh, all I do here. So let me look. So we have the core. Global extension, uh, which is just what I said, that if, that if you have um, any statement about the real world and real objects, it remains true when you, in the non-standard extension, in the, ex, in the supernatural extensions. The, 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 the statement stays true, okay, in the same sense. Bijection, I use that there's a bijection from the objects onto the uh, classes of reals such that A star is A. Yeah, what about those impoverished A whose supernatural extension is itself? The empty sets are early, early, you know, and in non-standard analysis, that's like the finite, the really finite sets. But it's much more subtle here. So look at the ones which don't blow up under, under their supernatural extension. They remain stable. Then we want that, uh, that those include, by the way, the singletons of all the supernatural objects, for example. So we know that this is as big as the supernatural object world. So I want to say it's the same size. So there's a bijection. And if you think about it, you can get models of this. Certainly from J from V uh, kappa into V kappa, you get this. Because you take J and you use J to do the extensions. And then you do get this, uh, this, uh, this bijection and so forth. So you know that this thing, uh, actually, I'm not sure that what I said is true. I'm sorry, there's a problem with what I just said. Because we're going to transfer second order statements. So you really need, J from V lambda plus one into V lambda plus one to do this argument. Superficially. V lambda into V lambda is not enough for this. Interesting. And I don't know if that's strong, but I, I, I made claims in here that this was, um, uh, yeah, so I think what happens is you get these enormous systems, some of which wouldn't know that without choice, they're as strong as they are with choice. Sometimes he doesn't know that, sometimes he does know that. 
But if you add choice to all this, then there's no problem. We don't need uh, to worry about that, and you get this stuff. So I think the, re the way I should uh, write this up is, is, show, is give a, a tight, maybe not absolutely tight, equivalence with elementary embedding axioms without choice, and then elementary embedding axioms with choice, when you put the choice in, and then, and then um, there's some work of Wooden's about, uh, about when you can interpret choice back, you know, which works for very strong things, it works for very weak things, and there's some intermediate range where he doesn't know how to do this kind of thing. So that came up in a paper I submitted. This issue came up. Um, the, the paper on, on universes, which is another branch of, another part of uh, concept calculus. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm within 30 seconds of the time limit. So I'll stop here. That is actually, I, see, I'm going to prove to you. I'm pressing the button. There's no more. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. that this is about one million orders of magnitude less than what I'm talking about. But I think the idea would be that that kind of fine tuning, bringing in the relativization, might be good enough when I do this to hit every large cardinal anybody cared about. Yeah. So in other words, it might be a good way to fine tune the thing. You see, because there's a lot of things you probably could do there that you couldn't do with, these, you know, with, with, with just the flat out things. Yeah. But, it's, but you're not going to impress me with ATR naught in this talk. No, it's, it's a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you, I, I assume you appreciate the eerie analogies. And there may be a, a, you know, some sort of general theory that if you take anything at all in, this, in the intellectual universe, there's a non-standard form of it that uh, is interesting. You see. Because now we have two ca cases, non-standard analysis and arithmetic and non-standard set theory. But you know, the word non-standard has a connot negative connotation, of course, so I don't like to use this here, right? <laughs> so you know, there is this um, grand unification. Possibly. So large cardinals as non-standard set theory. That might be a way of talking about it. Um, but you're buying into this, right? That this, is, this analogy is, looks uh, important. You believe? Okay, good. See, I'd already convinced him at lunch the other days. So. <laughs> The, um, as far as I know, this basic thing about Z2, fl uh, flat, uh, flattened out, Z2 ma made into something where the arithmetic is gone. The arithmetic is completely replaced by pairing idea. 
Uh, as far as I know, that's probably, th that's due to me. But however, I wouldn't be that surprised if somebody complains. You know, because it's, you know, I, what I would do, for example, is ask Albert Visser whether he'd ever seen this. Yes. Did you? So, so the fact that he can use Parrot to build the arithmetic, I, I don't know uh, all those references for it. Yeah, well, in various contexts, I guess. But we know, you see, here's the point. With the first order systems, you can't use pairing to get arithmetic. You know that. You know about that. Yes. OK. So. The feeling is somehow, I don't know that there's a good, clean statement of this thing in the literature, but, there, but, it, but, it, but it's at least essentially known, right? That, that's the fair statement. I don't, you know, I don't know that there's a good, clean statement, but it's essentially known. I would say essentially known, yeah. Um, the other question. Um, now, I only came up with it within the last year or two, developing concept calculus uh, because I wanted to make everything flatter to get away from set theory. Um, and also, it's much easier to talk to, say, your wife about these flat things, or your husband if you're a logician and your husband is, is a house husband or whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's much uh, uh, easier to talk about flat stuff with your spouse then talk about the cumulative hierarchy tagged with ordinals and so forth. You know, see, so this is much, much, much more friendly. Um, so that's how I came up with wanting to pin this down, even though I, you know. So, I mean, you know, so, so uh, all these principles, so you can look at the FOM list and find out that this eight consistency proof abstract was in fact like the third or fourth abstract containing a lot of similar material done, ba done badly before, or at least done more badly, excuse me, I should say, done more badly before. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, the last couple of years. And then also in the last couple of years, you know, things like uh, the universe paper that uh, hasn't been published. But then I got all excited about uh, the theology. Uh, it suddenly came to me, you know, I had listened to um, the Girdle meeting, 2006, right? The Girdle meeting, there were some talks on, on Girdle's uh, work on theology. Um, Oda Freddy and, and another, oh, and Hayek both talked about this. And I remember not really fully understanding, because, you know, it went on the modal side of this. I stayed, by the way, two to the one million miles away from modal logic. Okay, I want to make it clear, okay, in this thing. So, <laughs> so the point is that... Uh, 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 I remember this, but I had this idea, oh, positive properties, that is deep. And uh, I remember having the vague idea that maybe something should be done about this uh, as far as um, consistency proofs for ZF. You know, somehow it came to me, but I never saw how to do it. See, one of the problems is there, these people are talking about a, 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 um, a, a principal ultrafilter. Right? It, 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 you know, God is the point. Principal ultra filter. And, you know, part of my problem then was what can you do with a principal ultra filter? It's pretty hard to do anything with a principal ultra filter, right? So, but then somehow, you know, uh, in the last year or so, or year and a half, some, some number, small number, less than two, and um, it dawned on me that um, maybe this should be projected onto the real world. And then you get a non-principal ultrafilter, and everything hangs together because you get like, like every person is better than for every person there's a better person probably, because you know. Because the way a, a non-principal ultrafilter will normally work, and so forth, and so on. you know, so so you get you get this. Now I tell you an interesting story. David Mumford, a, a luminary American algebraic geometer, uh, who went into actually applied mathematics after retiring from Harvard and winning his Fields Medal in Algebraic Geometry. I was talking to him on the phone, and he said about this uh, divine consistency proof, and he says, you know, I never liked the idea of logicians getting up there and saying, we have a measure on the power set of a set without giving any ideas to what the measure does or why, 
how do you measure? <laughs> uh, you know, it was all, you know, I didn't, you know, it was just sort of thrown out there, you know. And you're telling me that this is steeped in, the, in, in a certain kind of history of a certain kind of theology. And I like this much better. <laughs> he liked it much better than the, than the way the set theorists talked about a measurable cardinal, because it's just a set with, with a, with a two-valued, you know, the big and small subsets, but coming from no, no mathematics. It, so it comes from no mathematics. No, you know, you can just say that there is this thing, right? It comes from nowhere. And, and, and so, uh, and it doesn't help that much to go to fine structure, but Bumford certainly didn't pay attention or relate to the fine structure. You know, you still have to say that the measure comes from somewhere first before you can build a, build a, a preferred measure from it. You still, so, uh, so he said, since it's not coming from anything mathematical, why, did, why not come from theology? You know, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, it's a very interesting, uh, See, I think this thing is, um, I think people may underestimate this. This might actually be important, you know, you know in some way. Exactly how, I don't, I'm, you know, is not clear. But, there, you know, there's something about this that I think is, uh, uh, see, you, maybe you could just go to look at anything like ethics or personal relations, and you can come up with the same system. You know, there are positive things you can say to somebody. And, that, and they're, they're, you know, you know, or any qualitative thing where you, this is better than this, you know. Any qualitative thing, maybe you can sort of develop a theory where, it, where it, it's cut and dry. And either it or its negation is good. And then just simply restate this kind of system, you know, anywhere in intellectual thought. You see, you know, this is, a, this is a possible way to go. And then maybe something in, a, in another subject, a subject matter, there's some other structure or thing around, which when you combine it with this, you get some surprising consequence. or some surprising thing that comes out of it. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think... I told I was I was in Princeton. I was talking to Psychoach about this, and he gave me um, a zillion analogies in math to this. With um, uh, there was something about um, uh, uh, ideals, uh, uh, ideal theory. He thought of a whole bunch of analogies with ideal theory. Now, of course, this is sticking it in math. You know, and I, you know, maybe it should be stuck in. Um, Personal relations, or something, you know, or politics, or something. Uh, uh, also, there is this idea of finite forms. I try to make a career out of making everything finite, so it's not clear what the fo finite way of looking at this is. All this stuff uses predicate calculus as a sledgehammer. Okay, and I spent a whole other part of my career. You'll hear about it in my next talk. A whole part of my career trying to remove predicate calculus completely. As you know, remove it completely. So those are the other side. By the way, am I supposed to talk next? Oh, no, we're having a break. What are we doing? So it's half past one. I think we could start around two o'clock. Okay. So after lunch. So we just finish with lunch and then we come back. So we do lunch now. Oh. Maybe five minutes later. So I should not have given a whole talk as an answer to uh, a question. Yes. yes, I should not have done that. Are we eating lunch right now? Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay, got it.